Welcome everybody to this week's uh, Green Bank Community Zoom. Uh, I'm Jim Jackson, and um, just a few remarks about what's happening at the observatory. Um, we had a nice double IS meeting in Pasadena. So <clears throat> thank all of you who stopped by. We had a nice uh, number of student presentations and um, our swag was the hit of the entire conference, especially the plastic uh, fork and spoon combination. Uh, the proposal call is um, for semester 23, 23B is nearing completion. Uh, the deadline will be uh, beginning of August, August 1st. And uh, we will be tentatively offering the uh, ultra wide band receiver for uh, this, um, this semester. Uh, the ultra wide band receiver is going up on the telescope uh, tomorrow for further testing. And so uh, fingers crossed it all goes well there. And we're very optimistic that we'll provide that interesting new capability for our users. So that's uh, life at Green Bank. Good to see people back on campus. We have a couple of student groups here today. So it's, it's, uh, it's nice to see uh, lots of activity on the, on the site. I'll hand it off now to Dave Freyer who will introduce today's speaker. Hi, um, welcome everybody. Our speaker today, we're happy to have is Zhangzi Lee, and she's from Caltech, and she's going to be talking about the magneto environment around pulsars and FRBs. Um, I, I'd like to remind the audience, if you have questions, put it into the Q&A box down in the lower right, typically of your Zoom windows, a little icon, and then we'll take, she'll take the questions after her talk is done. Okay, go ahead and take it away. Let's see if you can share your screen. Uh, yep. Thanks. Uh, so is it? Shared? We see your screen. No. Perfect. Sounds and great. Okay. And you can hear me, right? Yes, we uh, do. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Dongzi from Caltech, and today I'm going to talk about the magnetoactive environment near pulsars Pulsar and fast radio bursts. So um, I kind of feel that people probably already know about pulsar and fast radio burst. So I will start by in, uh, start from introducing the magneto environment. So there are magnetic field almost everywhere in the universe, and it's very important. It's guiding lots of formation procedures, and the magnetic field also exists everywhere. But the order of magnitude is off by a lot, going from near a star to ISM to IGM. However, all of that could leave imprints if we're observing in radio, like a band at like around the gigahertz. All of that could leave their imprints on the radio signal we receive. So one of the most common imprints is the Faraday rotation. Um, so uh, for example, in the typical ISM, we, uh, we can visualize that as in the uh, point car sphere. So the, uh, the, the elliptical plane, uh, the equator plane is the QU, which is a linear polarization, and the two pole is a circular. So the Faraday rotation is the um, your your vector um, rotating around the circular polarization axis. And the right panel is what this effect looks like. So the different lines are, the stable lines are the total polarization, linear polarization fraction and circular fraction. And the oscillating one is the, the two components of linear which is Q and U. And, and the oscillation is proportional to the total electron uh, times the magnetic field times the wavelength square. So from this wavelength square uh, dependence is usually how we distinguish Faraday rotation. It is okay if you're not familiar with it. I will later on point out what are the things that I'm trying to show. So Faraday rotation is so common. All of those things usually they can have some uh, effects in the Faraday rotation. I would think that it's just like cows. You can see it everywhere. Like even if you're a vegetarian, you probably see it uh, next table. But there's also other effect. So Faraday rotation is so common that sometimes we forget that it's an approximation. So in the act magnetoactive region, actually the effect will transit from Faraday rotation to a more general form, which is when the rotation axis is no longer pointing towards the circular. It 
it oscillate, uh, it, it can transit from circular to linear and it's a continuous transition. And in this case, when it's all, when you're rotating along this axis, it's no longer like only QU rotation, but it's also sort of a QUV rotation. So the circular position would change. And this is sort of the Faraday rotation. We see that the circular, which is the blue line, is unchanged, while in the Faraday conversion, the blue line starts to change. And it's okay if you don't remember what. Uh, what these lines are all about, but just just few things is like first, like the the it will we will lead total linear fraction and circular fraction to change, and also it will have different frequency dependence. So it's pretty distinguishable from Faraday rotation, and it's more distinguishable when it's wide band. So um, so Faraday conversion is more like a. Um, like usually in the ISM and IGM, when the magnetic field is low, um, it's very difficult for this effect to happen. But near the sun, when it's approaching like Gauss level, we started to have a chance to see it. So it's like rhino, it's no longer, you can see everywhere. You probably only see it in the zoo. And, um, so, and also, but, but Faraday conversion is, uh, it was very interesting effect because this is only happening in the interesting region. So it's just like rhino, it has their special habitat and studying us would help us to understand the habitat. So, so while Faraday rotation, because it's so common, so everything in the foreground will contribute to Faraday rotation. It's an integrated effect, but Faraday conversion, it, it has to satisfy certain stringent a stringent condition for it to happen. So actually it's sort of focused on special regions and there's less ambiguity. And also because it's it's difficult to happen. So it gives us this constraint, like uh, what is this environment, environment is so that we can have this effect. So now like there's the question. So it's interesting, but why is it like very rarely seen? One thing is it difficult to happen, but the other thing is like, there's sometimes a little bit difficulty. So how to catch this rhino? First, you have to have a polarized source. And then like a, um, another difficulty is like you, you have to have you have to be able to distinguish the propagation effect from emission property. When it is a large effect, when it oscillates a lot against frequency, it's not difficult. But when it's like a marginal, it starts to have an effect, then this, you will have some question like whether it's your emission property changes against frequency or it's your actually experience for the conversion. So uh, today I'm going to talk about a case that I we recently used GBT to successfully catch a rhino. So um, this system is a pulsar and a companion. Pulsar is in the globular cluster, it's a millisecond pulsar, and the companion is only around one solar radius away from the pulsar. So this system is perfect because uh, this is a demonstration. The companion is a low mass companion circulating around the pulsar. So, so because it's an orbiting system, we naturally have phase when the companion is in front of the pulsar and the phase when the companion is behind the pulsar. So looking at uh, the left figure, um, so at 0.25, here I denote 1.25, well, because there are several orbits. So this is 0.25 actually equivalent to the right panel. Um, when the companion is uh, uh, in front of the powder, the, the circular polarization, this panel is circular polarization, it changes signs. So if you average like, so um, this chunk is when the companion is behind the powder. So the line of sight is far from the companion. That shows us the, property of the emission. So what is the intrinsic polarization? And then when the line of sight is approaching the companion, we see that the polarization first turns zero and then flip a sign. And that's a very 
a very clean measurement because we know what is uh, what is in initially should be and what is the propagation effect. And, and then we can see um, this prop, this sign flipping, which is a characteristic feature of Faraday conversion, is persisting really stably whenever you can see emission near the, when the line of sight is close to the companion. So in this demonstration, this red shaded, shaded region are like the region where we can stably see Faraday conversion. And it's not only persist like over different orbits, it's also persisting against frequency. So even in the highest frequency, you can see a very clean flip and going to the lower frequency, this, this flip persists. So, um, so given these two features, then there are different ways to introduce the Faraday conversion, but given these two features, the most uh, plausible way is that this is a mode tracking. So when the parallel magnetic field changes, uh, changes signs, so when the parallel magnetic field flips, uh, if the magnetic field is large enough and the flip is slow enough, your, your wave will follow this flip. So your wave, the two circular polarization will, will switch and then you will observe a circular polarization. So this can also be distinguished, um, demonstrated in the, in the, um, in the point cast sphere. So when the, when the field is changing signs, you, you will see the natural axis just flipping, going from positive V to the negative V, and then your, your wave vector follows it and, and it, will, it will flip the circular polarization. And the most natural way for it to happen, it's actually pretty happy, uh, natural to happen like close to the companion, given that if the companion has a, a poloidal field, so whenever, wh whichever direction this magnetic axis is, the line of sight should always experience a sign change in the uh, parallel magnetic field unless like the magnetic axis is parallel to the line of sight, but that's a very extreme case. So in most of the common way you place this um, poloidal field, the line of sight should naturally experience a large scale uh, sign flipping. So here is the demonstration. If I put in a dipole field, um, this is the change of the absolute magnetic field and the red line is the change of parallel magnetic field. And the uh, uh, VUQ is incoming wave, how it changes uh, when it pass through this region. So you can see that um, this oscillation of QU is the Faraday rotation, but when it gets close to the sign flipping points, the Faraday rotation slows down and then the Faraday conversion happens and then the circular polarization changes signs. And, and that, because that system, we know how much excess electron we have near the uh, superior conjunction. We know the observation frequency. We can constrain the magnetic field um, in the line of sight, which is greater than 10 Gauss. And also this system is really nice. So the circular polarization has pretty complicated like uh, profile. Um, this is just serve as, you know, when you do the polarization calibration, you usually sometimes do, do parallelic angle like uh, um, correction because you, you, want, you want the system to you want the signal to go through the same propagation effect, well, well, same instrumental effect in the calibration, but it start from a different phase originally. So this pulse profile naturally serve this prop purpose. So it, it naturally have different circular polarization. And then all those circular polarization is going through the same um, propagation matrix, and then it lands to the final observation. So we can very well constrain the uh, parameter in the in the in the propagation matrix. So the dotted are dot the dots in the right panel are the observation data. The lines are I'm using the uh, profile in the left panel and propagate through the matrix and fit the 
propagation matrix. And, and you can see that it actually can very nicely reproduce the profile near the superior conjunction. And it shows that like they have gone through a clear mode tracking, like full flip of sign and some circular absorption. Um, so given this, like uh, we can constrain the magnetic field strength, as I said before, it's greater than 10 Gauss near the superior conjunction. And so it has to be greater than 100 Gauss near the surface of the companion. And also we can give a prediction about the behavior of circular polarization against frequency. Um, so the sign flipping will persist, but the flipping area will get narrower um, at higher frequency. And also because like this curve, the, this curve depend, uh, depends on how fast the magnetic, the magnetic field drops against orbital when, when the line of sight is moving away from the companion. So it actually can tell us like the inclination angle. So now we have a very narrow frequency width so that you're, we are sort of like just show that this effect happens. But if we have like this ultra wideband receiver, it will be very helpful for us to see this curve and constrain the inclination angle. And once you have the inclination angle, you can constrain the mass of the pulsar. And, and because those are like the spider pulsar, the companion is to low mass, it's difficult to measure it through the um, through the timing, and uh, and this way, like it's a very new measurement of the inclination angle, and I'm very interested to test it. And this system is not only have this rhino effect, it also has some Faraday rotation effect because it's magnetoactive. So previously, the, the Faraday conversion happens when the line of sight is close to the superior conjunction. But when it's far away from the superior conjunction, when the companion is like sort of behind the pulsar, we're still able to see large rotation measure change, um, which happens should happen in the wind of the companion. So, uh, so this uh, left panel is the observation observed at L band because the pulsar is brighter there. So we are able to measure it. And also at the lower frequency, we are able to measure the rotation measure better. So we can see there's some uh, both negative and positive change around like uh, um, point, point, point nine and like phase point six. So it's pretty behind the pulse uh, when the companion is like far away from the line of sight. And also like this system, we're able to see mini eclipses and DM variations like uh, all across the orbit. It's a very uh, vibrant environment. And also even its X-ray observation is showing that it's um, the X-ray flux is changing a lot. So it's a, it's a very, the wind is pretty unstable. And, and there are also regions where, uh, so here look at the green circle. So the total flux is still there and the DM changes drastically and the, and the linear polarization just depolarized. And it's depolarized as expected because we, because this region is close to the region where we see RM changes from last cycle. So we can estimate the lower limit of magnetic field strengths. And then times the dispersion measure changes, it actually, we expect few thousand like uh, RM changes in that spots. Uh, at least few thousand, it can be much higher. Um, so that's why when we average lots of pulses, it's depolarized. But it's just all those depolarized linear polarization are potentially showing there are lots of even larger RM variation, like larger than the level we measured, like we measured 100, but it can go to 1,000, 10,000. It's a very highly magnetized system. 
So uh, summarize this observation property of this system. We have large irregular RM variation. We have depolarization due to fast RM variation. We have polarized absorption and Faraday conversion. And we have in the propagation, uh, we have increased circular polarization in specific phase. And also given the uh, field strengths we estimate from the Faraday conversion, we actually expect the huge RM, like when the linear side is approaching the, the um, superior conjunction. And although we are unable to uh, measure it because of the depolarization, but we can expect it like 10 to the six RM um, near the superior conjunction. And those actually sound a little bit familiar because recently there are lots of polarimetry study of the fast radio burst. It starts accumulating just um, fairly recently. And they're showing lots of similar behavior. So first introduce fast radio burst. Fast radio bursts are energetic short radio burst of un still unknown origin. So it's first discovered in 2007. So it's a fairly new phenomenon discovered. And it's much more energetic than pulsar. So it can be uh, detected in the cosmological distance. And unlike pulsar where you can see regular pulses, fast radio bursts, usually you just see one burst. But the observation property is pretty similar. It's just like you're detecting a single burst from pulsar. Um, and recently there are lots of um, FRBs that show that the source can repeat, so it may not be catastrophic events. And there's a detection of FRB-like burst from a galactic magnetar showing that at least uh, some neutron star is able to produce this kind of bright bursts. So a very similar environment sounds like. So, and now we compare the magneto environment. So the, in the Terzan 5, we see large irregular RM variation and the FRBs, there are like in the five out of six repeaters with more than one RM measurement. They have show RM variations and some are really large. Like the, look at the lower panel, the FRB 2019-0520, the RM changes like a, um, like from positive to negative in the time scale of months and the absolute value is also pretty large. And also all these other effects like the depolarization, it has been discussed for at least two FRBs and there's uh, potential signs of polarized absorption and Faraday conversion. And also if there are proper induced circular polarization, it can explain the large varying circular polarization in the, this particular FRB. And also, uh, as we said that like near the uh, superior conjunction, the expected RM is 10 to the six. And that's what we observe, observe with FRB 2012, 11, 02, 8. Uh, so the, the, the points with like, uh, uh, with solid points are very convincing and the points with just uh, shallow like uh, thoughts are like suggestive effects. Uh, because for fast radio bursts, like uh, we don't have this comparison of uh, intrinsic property and propagation effect. So it's less clean to discuss this effect. But once we, so it's very nice to learn that from the pulsar and show that it's, it can happen in the pulsar and we can uh, apply this method to fast radio burst. And, and all those properties sort of have a one-to-one -one match to the fast radio burst. And it's not like some very, um, very easy thing because those properties are really observed in other sources. It's not observed in like normal pulsars and it's not observed in like normal uh, magnetars unless except the one that's close to the galactic center. Um, so it's actually, it's just like the rhino. You see a rhino and it's happening in specific habitat uh, and you see another rhino looks similar. Maybe they're from the same habitat.
So maybe a fraction of fast free bursts are in binaries, uh, although probably not in such close binaries, but binaries can have different separation of different magnetic field. This one has a very small companion, but if you have a larger companion, uh, you can see similar effects up to the distance of AU separation. And also there are other observational hints, like there's a fast radio burst detected in the globular cluster, where it's pretty old to host a young magnetar, uh, but there are lots of binaries in the global cluster. And there are FRBs to observe to have like a order 10 day periodicity. Um, and it's, uh, it's sort of pretty natural to explain that with the binary orbit period. So it's a, it's a interesting, uh, it's not like a, um, a definite evidence, but there are lots of semi like hints suggesting this direction. Maybe it's a very interesting way to think about it. And also at least we show that in this, uh, not a special, um, binary, I think ter, ter 5a is sort of a normal red back. Um, you can actually produce all this extreme uh, un, unusual polarization um, effect like uh, in this system. So that can be a one direction. So in summary, uh, we have caught the rhino with the GBT. So we saw this global cluster pulsar binary showing very rare and diverse polarization behavior. And we can very nicely model this behavior and use this as a way to study the propagation effect. I think the Faraday conversion apart from the sun is never convincingly detected outside of our solar system. And also we can use that to constrain the companion magnetic field which is potentially uh, related to how this system evolved. And also uh, we can potentially use it to constrain the inclination angle and constrain the mass of the pulsar. And also uh, it shows that this rear, this rear diverse polarization behavior, similar polarization behavior has been seen in FRBs. And we show that this can be introduced with the the existence of a companion. And of course, for the future perspective, wideband observation is of great value, not only to the study the polarization effect from the plasma, but in general plasma propagation effect because they are highly chromatic. So, so we'd love to have the wideband system. And, and the last is like polarization study is fun and informative. And um, thank you. Thank you. Very, uh, very nice talk. Um, I, people can put their questions into the Q&A and we'll go ahead and go over the questions um, as they're waiting for questions to come in. Um, the globular cluster binary, how close was it? I'm, I might have missed that. So how? Uh, separation, binary separation, 0.85 yeah. solar radius. Oh my, okay. Yeah, very close. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very close. Yeah, yeah but okay. that's also a very very small companion with small mass loss rate. And it's like, okay. if you, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I didn't realize, wow, that is really close. Okay. Yeah, you, it's a okay. very, very close system. Very interesting. So, so that's why like you only need a couple of hours to like have several orbit collected. It's like two hour orbit, yeah. Okay, we have a, a question that came in, or a couple of questions that came in. The first question is, um, what type of star is orbiting the companion red giant? And I'm a little confused by that because you're talking about a binary pulsar. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, so the, the, I'm not sure either. So this system is a pulsar with a point, uh, 089 solar mass companion, which can be a, either a M dwarf or a Y dwarf, but a dwarf. Okay. Yes. Yeah, a sort of dwarf star rotating around a, a and a pulsar neutron star. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, another question. Oh. Oh, somebody was just asking a very general question. What is the meaning of RM? I probably missed it. 
Oh yeah, my, my fault. I should have introduced that. So RM is the rate, uh, how fast the Faraday rotation is, how much Faraday rotation it has experienced. And because the Faraday rotation is frequency dependent, so RM is the, the Faraday rotation angle equals RM lambda square. Uh, two RM lambda square, um, so it's a uh, quantity quantify the the rate of Faraday rotation. Yeah, yeah. So the RM stands for rotation measurement. Maybe uh, that's. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to add that. I don't know. Okay, another question. Any plans for higher time resolution observations to catch? the RM variation, or is the signal to noise ratio too low for that type of work? So they're wondering if you can even um, do even higher time resolution observations. Yes, I think the 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 bottom neck is the RM very uh, is the signal to noise ratio. Actually, our data is a much higher resolution. So another way is like uh, so this system it has some lensing effect. So uh, we we can't integrate less to get enough signal to noise, but sometimes we can detect single burst that is pretty bright. So in that case, there are less RM smearing. So so. So the next step will be looking at the single burst. Okay, um, another question. Can the magnetic field axis angle to the orbit of the companion be determined from the observations? Uh, potentially, uh, but that's much, I, I would think that's more difficult than the orbital inclination angle because the, the, uh, the, if you have a dipole field, the, the field strength is only changed by a factor of two from the from the pole to the uh, equator, but but the strengths go with r to the minus three, so it changes much faster radially than like at different angle. So I think in principle, it's probably possible to constrain the magnetic field axis angle because they have done that for the uh, binary pulsar case uh, from the eclipse, uh, but that requires much better measurement. Um, yeah, like, uh, yeah. Okay, um, are there any, Addition, oh, another one just came in. Um, can you tell where the pulsar lives within the globular cluster? Uh, it's not, it's sort of slightly far, uh, slightly away from the center. I don't remember exactly, probably a parsec from the center. It's not in the really dense region. It's sort of in the side yeah. region. Okay, the the, more in the outskirts yeah. a little bit. Okay. Um, I just have a follow-up question on the ultra wideband when you have that. Um, what else? I mean, I guess you can get higher signal noise, but besides, you know, you're saying having the frequency coverage to measure that. Uh, the, yeah. the so you, you're, you're asking why it's so interesting uh, with the ultra wideband? Yeah, I mean, what what do you think that'll give you? I know you 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 hinted at it a little bit. Yes, yes, yes. It, it's it's really interesting in in lots of aspect. Uh, apart from the uh, yeah, that plot, I'm noise, sorry. Yeah, the orbit. Yeah, uh, one thing is at lower frequency, it's easier to measure the RM changes and it's brighter, and and also DM changes. Uh, so at lower frequency, it can give you very accurate measurement of those property. But at higher frequency, it's less eclipse, so you have more flux towards the center, um, and also like the it can measure the so so currently because there's some so this one is I assume they have there's no eclipse but but in the real observation data is we have some mini eclipse in like all around here so so basically if you only measure the center near the superior conjunction um, it only gives you the lower limit of magnetic field but you sort of want to catch this transiting uh, region. And, and a higher like a 
a, a wide band system will enable you to measure this like transiting region. And this region is giving you the constraint of like how magnetic field changes uh, when the line of sight is moving away from the, from the uh, companion and, and like the orbital inclination angle, something. And also it can generally test the model that whether it's really this like uh, getting narrower shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and oh. and also uh, this is for this system. Uh, for other system, so uh, first you you don't really know when this like uh, so the Faraday conversion is like it suddenly happens and then like uh, you don't know which frequency it happens and which frequency it eclipses. So for this system, we sort of probably know where it st stops eclipsing and where it starts flipping. But if we want to generally study this phenomenon with other um, um, uh, spider pulsar, then you need a wide system. It's easier for you to catch the right frequencies to study this phenomenon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't appreciate that, but that makes sense. Um, are there any, oh, <laughs> a comment, uh, very nice work. Thank you. <laughs> in the question, and I agree. So I find that sort of very interesting on what you're able to pull out um, by looking at the um, rotation measures. Um, any other questions? If okay, so thank you very much for presenting today, and um, and thank you everybody for coming and and listening. Our next uh, community Zoom event will be two weeks from today, and then I think it's Scott Ransom's on talking about oops I did it on my other I'm assuming he's talking about nanograph he's gonna talk about the nanograph results so um thank you everybody and thank you again for um presenting today everybody have a good day thank you